most common uh, issues I see with with cold starts are probably people loading people putting code in there and loading it and never using it at all. Um, so this goes back to only only package what you need. We talked about with the AWS SDK. I see on a multi week basis, multiple times a week, I see um, a helpful developer who went out and built a package to you know publish to EventBridge, and it, maybe that includes the entire SDK, right? Just on accident. Or I see production builds that have open API, right? Where you're generating like a swagger doc every time your Lambda function runs just, just to, to do that. And I see that more and more with those like mono Lambda APIs where you're taking an entire API you've already built and sort of copying it into Lambda and, and routing with uh, the, um, like routing internally with something like Express or something like Flask. Um, and then, yeah, probably the fifth, the fifth one for cold starts that's most common is... Um, taking old patterns, like having to put a giant request router into your Lambda function and, and using that all the time. Um, and if you look at an application that most people are going to run in Lambda, in, in in many cases, the the distribution of requests to that function are not equal or not even you know normal. What you see is one route, maybe you know, get timeline feed. If we're building like a Twitter clone, that will be the most hit route or like get user or get tweet. You can break those out into their own dedicated functions and not load any of the other code you're loading. That's a really big improvement you can just make. Um, the other one is lazy load. So I wrote a blog post about this as well. And especially with what we've talked about, you know, mounting the zip FS and how that can improve your cold, your cold start time. If you don't load the bytes, you don't need one thing you can do is conditionally load dependencies. So if you have a user in this case, uh, my example is API gateways talking to AWS Lambda, which is then writing DynamoDB. It's a REST API, but we have this, you know, particular user, which is me in this example, needs to be needs a message to be published to SNS as well. Loading that SNS client, initializing it, making the connection, all of that takes time. And if you don't have to do that for every request or even most requests, it makes sense to put that in a branch and just say, okay, if this request is for AJ, then let's load the the API let, let's load the the SNS SDK and by doing that once it's loaded once it's it's memoized like the node runtime keeps it around so you don't have to reload it even if you call a method again it'll be loaded um, so there's an advantage there but finally you you make it so that the person that has that special case is going to pay that performance impact um, and again there, there's a little bit of nuance here when it comes to how much uh, CPU you're getting so we can clearly see that during initialization where we have that theoretically full vCPU or maybe simply more CPU power, we see that the SNS client can load in about 50 milliseconds. However, when we defer this to runtime, when a Lambda function requests uh, the SNS client, we see it loads in about 80 milliseconds. And this function specifically, I think, is running in 1024 gigabyte, or like, uh, sorry, 1024 megabyte or one gigabyte of RAM. So I would expect to have a little bit less vCPU. They published that 1769 is the magic number to get one full vCPU in Lambda, and this is under. So this is exactly what I would expect to see as a result. So yeah, that's probably the, the, the last tip is unlike your applications that are load balanced, where maybe you can load everything up front and then put it behind the load balancer and start serving traffic, in Lambda, that time is always going to be felt by users. So you may as well um, figure out who, like which requests need which dependencies, and you can use that as a, as a performance improvement.